I'm Mr. Hrobler, and today I'm here to talk to you about something we all have in common. Your body and mine is constantly in a battle to keep everything stable inside the body, to keep it the same. There are many factors that have to be kept the same. In today's discussion in our revision lesson, we'll be looking at four aspects inside your body that has to stay the same all the time. Now, these processes we refer to as homeostatic control. Let's see which are these four aspects that we will be discussing today. Here you see the first one, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide levels in the body cannot go too high. It becomes a problem. Water cannot go too high in concentration or too low. It's a problem. Salt cannot go too high or too low in concentration in the blood. It's dangerous. The same applies to glucose. Some people suffer from sugar diabetes. The sugar levels in the blood cannot be too high or too low. It creates tremendous medical issues. Now, in this discussion, there are certain terminologies that you need to understand. Let's look at the first few terminologies. The first question is, when we talk about homeostatic control, what is this process that we call homeostasis? We will be referring to a concept of concentration. And I will refer to, when I talk about salt concentration as an example, I will put it, like in chemistry, in square brackets like that. But what really do we mean by the concept of, let's say, high salt concentration, or perhaps low concentration? And then we'll be looking at the homeostatic process. How does it really work? So let's then move into these definitions. Or can you remember, perhaps, what is homeostasis in the whole process of homeostatic control? Let's look at a definition. Homeostasis is your body's ability to maintain a stable internal environment. And that is despite the changes in the external environment. There could be changes, but your body must maintain a constant internal environment. That is the first definition that you need to know. What about concentration that we spoke about? Like we spoke about the salt concentration. We're referring to the amount of the salt dissolved in a solution. So if we say there's a high salt concentration, we simply mean there is a lot. There is basically, in common English, we basically say if it's too high, if the salt concentration is too high, there's basically too much salt in the body. So we'll be looking at various processes. But the whole homeostatic control is basically all about problem solving inside the body. Now, the body solves the problems in the same way that we solve problems at home or at school. Think of a scenario at school. Let's say there's trouble at the gate. There's some security threat. What needs to happen to solve the problem? First of all, somebody has to identify the problem. You can't solve a problem if you don't know what the problem is. So somebody has to identify the problem, clearly understand what is the problem, and then send a message to the office that school management can come up with a plan. That plan has to be communicated back to the security at the gate, and then they can implement the plan of the management. Now notice in our discussion today, when we discuss the homeostatic control process, that it happens just like that. The body is trying to solve problems to keep everything stable. Let's run through that process. Here's the homeostatic process. So first of all, the body has to decide and pick up, detect what is the problem. But something has to identify the problem. Otherwise, you can't solve the problem. Now, there must be a, like a head office or a control center for each problem in the human body. And we'll often see that this is often in the brain, not always, but there are certain centers in the brain, which is like the head office, 
And then there are messengers involved. Now these messengers are chemical messengers and they are called hormones. Please take note in each case when we discuss various aspects which hormones are involved and then there must be some structures to implement the plan to correct the matter, to bring it back to normal again. This is basic problem solving. We use the same method when we solve problems, but the body or and the body does the same. It goes through this homeostatic process by following the five steps that you can see here. So let's now look at the first aspect of homeostasis. And it has to do with a situation where you perhaps work hard or you run and you produce a lot of carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide can cause havoc in your blood. We need to get rid of it to bring it back to normal again. Let's look at the structures. Here you see a diagram representing the respiratory system. Now you know all over the body we've got a process called cellular respiration. Now that is all about producing, it's all about producing energy. But in the process there's a gas that is released. That gas is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide should not accumulate in the body. So the carbon dioxide comes from all over the body with the blood into the lungs. Carbon dioxide travels with the blood into the lungs. Now there are certain structures like this muscle here that's like a flat muscle lying here called the diaphragm. This diaphragm will move up and push the air that's in the lungs with the carbon dioxide out so that you can exhale and get rid of the carbon dioxide. It must go out. So there are muscles for this function. These, this big muscle here at the bottom that changes shape to become more convex like that when you exhale, that muscle is the diaphragm. Please take note of these muscles between the ribs. These muscles that push the ribs down so that you can exhale are called intercostal. Intercostal muscles. They work together with the diaphragm to get rid of the carbon dioxide. So let's now look at a typical question that you would get. But first of all we said when you deal with problems with regards to homeostasis you can't solve a problem if you don't identify the problem. Now, which structures in your body picks up the problem that you've been running, there's too much carbon dioxide and you must get rid of it. It's not around here in the lung area. It actually sits, there are receptors in the arteries that run up in your neck. This side and this side, there are arteries that transport blood from your heart into your brain. So here are receptors that detect the problem of too high carbon dioxide concentration. Let's look at the question we saw in the previous paper. What detects the change in carbon dioxide concentration in the blood, let's say when you are running, you're building up too much carbon dioxide? What detects it? Here comes the answer. Those arteries that run up to the brain, are called carotid arteries. The carotid arteries are sensitive to the increase in carbon dioxide. The receptors there actually detect the problem. Now let's continue to look at another question when it comes to the respiratory control. Describe the homeostatic control of carbon dioxide in the human body. And here comes the answer. When you have physical activity, the rate of cellular respiration obviously increases to produce a lot of energy because you are working hard. This results in a higher carbon dioxide concentration and it must be detected by those receptors in the carotid artery as we said. Now this sends impulses to head office. Head office is in the brain and that part of the brain where your breathing center is is called the medulla oblongata. The medulla now sends impulses to the diaphragm and also to the intercostal muscles that you must breathe faster and stronger. You know, it's, you know about this so well when you run. Why do you do that? To exhale the carbon dioxide and everything goes back to normal. Isn't that amazing how the body fixes problems very quickly? Let's just look at a sketch of the brain so that you can see exactly where is your medulla that's controlling the breathing process. 
here is the medulla. If you look at this area, which I've highlighted there, this is where the medulla is found. There are other parts of the brain which is for thinking, like here. There's other parts for balance. This is the spinal cord going down. But the medulla has got the breathing, the so-called respiratory system, a uh, respiratory center to control your breathing. It's controlled here from the medulla. So when we come back after a short break, we will be discussing water balances. It's very dangerous if you keep back too much water in the body. You swell up. It can accumulate around your lungs and it can cause trouble in your breathing. On the other hand, when you dehydrate and you lose too much water, it's also a big trouble for your tissue fluid. Don't stay away too long. So welcome back. We said uh, before the break we'll be talking now about water balances. Let's just uh, see what we've done so far and what we're still going to do. We've done carbon dioxide and we have seen that it should not be too high. It must come back to normal levels. Now we'll be focusing in this uh, section of the work. We'll be looking at the water balances, which tells you it must not be too high concentration of water in the body or too low. It must just be balanced. Otherwise, there's trouble. We will also be looking at salt concentration. It should not be too high. It should also not be too low. In both cases, you have medical problems. So now when we talk about that, let's talk about a few terminologies with regards to water balances and salt control. The first concept that you've seen in your textbooks is osmoregulation. Osmo has to do with water. Remember osmosis? So water balance is basically osmoregulation. Can you remember from your studies what really are nephrons? Do you remember the pituitary gland? It is the master gland in the body. It's found at the bottom of the brain. Remember, please, this word, the pituitary. ADH is a hormone that we will discuss, and we will see how important it is to take water back in the body. When you dehydrate, you should not lose water. You should rather reabsorb it, take it back. So let's look at a typical question that we've seen from past papers in our revision process. Here's a question. The structure below is found in the human kidney. It plays a major role in osmoregulation, which is what? Water balance. Let's look at this structure. Here you see it is a nephron. Now you know how many nephrons you have in one kidney. You actually have one million of these structures in your kidneys. They are microscopic, and this is where urine is produced. Ultimately, here at the bottom, through the, after the whole process, the droplets that accumulate here is urine that um, is then excreted from the body. But how is urine really produced? Let's just revise that. Blood comes into the kidneys, into these millions of nephrons, because you've got two kidneys. There's millions of these microscopic structures. Blood comes in here. It's been filtered. And what's filtered into this structure here are some useful substances and some that are waste products, which must go all the way the waste products will go through all these tubes, ultimately move down here and end up as part of the urine. That's where the waste must go. But all along the way, the useful products must go from these tubes back into the blood. It will go back into the blood. Now that is called reabsorption. These substances, like water, for instance, most of the water will be reabsorbed. It doesn't go all the way to become part of the urine here. Most of the water will be reabsorbed all along the way back into the blood. Now, I want you to focus on this label here. This part of the, the nephron tubules here is called the distal. The distal tubal. Now here, a lot of water is reabsorbed back in here. So now 
that we understand the whole process of urine production, let's look at further parts of this question. Describe the need for osmoregulation water balance when a person has basically, is busy sweating. Perspiration means he's sweating on a hot day. This person is busy dehydrating. There's a problem here. He's losing too much water. He's dehydrating. So what will the body do? Describe this for four marks. And here comes the answer. The person is losing water because he has to cool down so that the water can evaporate. It's a cooling process, but he's losing too much water. And he runs a risk of that he can die from dehydration. So the water concentration in the blood and in the tissue fluid has to, is now below normal and there's a need. There's a problem here. It has to be corrected. Now, when there's a problem, the problem has to be detected first. So the question is, what detects the problem in the body that this person has lost too much water, is busy dehydrating? Let's see. Name the part of the brain that actually detects the problem because that is where the whole solution can come from if we can detect the problem. So what is that part called? It is the hypothalamus. That is the answer to that. Now you'll ask, where is the hypothalamus here in the brain? It is this structure in the middle of the brain here. This is where the hypothalamus is. It's in the middle of the brain, sitting just above that master gland, which is here at the bottom, where I'm labeling now. The master gland, remember, is called the pituitary. And the pituitary then, under the influence of the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus stimulates the pituitary to release a hormone which must go all the way to the kidneys, where they will give their message. This hormone is called ADH. So let's see how it travels. Name the hormone secreted. We know it's ADH. There's the answer. Now you may use the abbreviation uh, in your exams, but the proper name is antidiuretic hormone. Now let's see what is the message that ADH brings to the kidneys. So here's the question. Describe the role of ADH to prevent dehydration. ADH is a messenger coming with a message with a plan. Let's see what the plan is. Here we're back to the structure where the urine is actually produced. Now you will agree, if you are busy dehydrating, you are suffering from dehydration because you're sweating too much on a hot day, you're playing soccer and, or netball, and the filtrate moves down here, and ultimately a lot of water is going to become part of the urine that will be leaving the body. You can't lose more water. You can't afford to lose even more water. So the water that's moving down in these tubes have now to go back. They have to be reabsorbed. Re means they must go back into the blood so that it can stay in the body. It must not become part of the urine. So on a hot day, you and I will produce less urine because the water should rather be reabsorbed here in the nephrons of the kidney. Now this whole process is under the control of this messenger that comes all the way from the pituitary, travels in the blood, and it comes here to the distal tubes with a message to say, open up please, open up here, so that the water can go back. Now you produce less urine and you have more water staying back and at least you're preventing yourself from dehydrating. Now let's put that in a formal question like we got in a question paper and look at the answer. ADH causes I use the word open up, but here, proper scientific language, greater permeability in the walls of the distal tubes. Basically, then the nephron giving the instruction to say, please open up so that we can have more water back in the blood. It must not go out with the urine.
because the person is dehydrating, he's shorting water. This causes more water to go where? To stay in the blood. And it increases more water retention or reabsorption. The amount of water that now goes into the urine is less. I think it makes complete sense to you. But let's examine the nephron further to see what else happens in the nephron. Because I'm talking about one nephron which is microscopically small, but remember per kidney, you've got one million of these microscopic structures. And in each of them, they each contribute little droplets in, of urine. That is where the urine is produced, but that is also the place where the body keeps back what it needs. So now we go to the homeostatic control of salt. Let's say you have a low salt concentration in the body. You cannot have too high or too low. But let's say it's low. You're going to have medical problems. High, you'll also have medical problems. Now describe the homeostatic control in the event of the salt concentration in the blood being low. Let's see how that happens. It also happens here in the nephron. The nephron also controls that. So we said, to detect a problem, you need some structure to identify the problem. Now, this whole problem is identified here. As the blood comes into the nephron here, and when it goes out again, there are little gauges sitting here and here to detect the problem. These structures, there are receptors there that detect low salt concentration or also high. It can detect. These gauges here detect the problem, whether it's too high or too low. Now, where's the control center? The control center actually sits on top of the kidneys. If you remember the kidneys, there's a structure on top of the kidney called the what? Can you remember what that is called? The adrenal gland. Now, the adrenal gland sends a messenger all the way, traveling here to the nephrons, once again to the distal tubes here, to say, we want you to open up, to become more permeable to salts, that the salts that you are sending out to become part of the urine should be less in the urine. The salts are needed now in the body. The salts must be reabsorbed back into the blood. Now, this messenger that travels all the way from the adrenal glands to bring the message here, to give the message that the salts should be reabsorbed, that hormone has a name, and it's called aldosterone. Do you see how amazing your body is that it can actually fix all these problems? They detect the problem, there's a control center, a messenger is sent, these messengers are hormones, and the hormones bring a plan to the organs to fix the problem. In this case, the organs that responded to the message were the kidneys. And with the little nephrons there, that's where the problem was solved. So let's look at a question. Typical exam question. Um, in discussing the whole pro homeostatic process, what is the imbalance? The imbalance here was the salt concentration was too low. Then which, organs identif uh, which organ identifies the problem? Remember, it was those receptors uh, just before the glomerulus of the kidney. The name of the control center, do you remember? It was the adrenal glands. And then the hormones involved, the hormone that was sent there is aldosterone. And the organs involved to correct the whole matter, the organ with their nephrons, are the kidneys. So let's look at some key points that we have discussed so far. Can you actually remember when I run through these key um, terminologies with regards to salt balance and um, water balance, do you remember what each of these mean? Let's have a look. Osmoregulation, what would you say is osmoregulation? Was it not water balance? The control of water. Then nephrons. 
what are the nephrons? Remember, there's one million of them in the kidneys. And this is where urine is produced. The pituitary, you remember, is the master gland. And the messenger sent from the pituitary, remember, is a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. And you will remember what that hormone does. It causes greater reabsorption of water, that you can keep the water back, that you don't dehydrate even more. So coming to think about this whole process, you've seen maybe an elderly person in your family where the water accumulates. She can't get her shoes on. The hands are swollen, even the face. Have you seen that? That is an over-retention of water. Keeping too much water back, it should go out with the urine, but it's not. In your case, as a young person, probably it's not happening because your homeostatic control is working well. It's so amazing how your body works. If you have too much water, we say too high water concentration. In common language, too much water must go out. On the other hand, if the water concentration of your tissue fluid or your blood is too low, you must keep all the water back. You will not even go and, and urinate. You will keep all the water back under the influence of which hormone again? ADH. Now we're going to have a short break. And when we come back, we will be discussing what is the whole situation with sugar diabetes? What goes wrong? And we will look at past papers to see how they ask questions on the hormones controlling your sugar balances. I'll see you just now. So we've been talking about this miracle happening in your body, how your body is in a constant battle to fix problems despite external changes around you. And we've been looking at a few aspects, and now we're moving towards the last one, which is very interesting. This last aspect is so interesting, but let's just see what we've done. We have looked at carbon dioxide. It should not be too high in concentration in your blood. It causes big trouble. Water should not be too high or too low. Neither of them. The same applies to the salt concentration. You have trouble if it's too high. You have medical problems if it's too low. Now we come to this interesting one. Glucose concentration in your blood and in my blood. It should stay around about 100 milligrams of glucose for every 100 milliliters of blood. If it's too high, that is where you suffer from sugar diabetes. So let's look at a few typical questions that I got from past papers. And uh, one, once you look at the diagram, you'll say, but this seems to be complicated. But I'll show you, it's so easy and it's fascinating how your organs work, internal organs, to maintain a constant glucose levels because if it's too high, you suffer from diabetes mellitus, they call it, sugar diabetes. You can have serious medical problems. It could even lead to death. We need to bring it under control. It should stay at that level of 100 milligrams for every 100 ml of blood. Let's look at a typical question. And before that, let's perhaps look at some uh, terminologies. We will be looking at insulin in comparison to the hormone, which is the opposite to insulin, glucagon. And then, what is the difference between glucagon with a Y and something totally different, glycogen? We will see what that is. How really is, are the glucose levels controlled? And then you always get graphs. When it comes to glucose concentrations and insulin, how can you interpret graphs? So let's go into a typical question that we saw in 2017 in the National Senior Certificate Paper 1. Now, my advice to you here is you look at only the one at a time. If there's too high levels, too high levels of glucose in the blood, perhaps you've eaten and you've digested food and you've got too high levels of glucose in the blood, let's follow the dotted line. For now, forget about the solid line that we see here. Let's just follow the pathway with your eye 
the dotted line. So if, the, if you have a situation where you've eaten perhaps and you've got high levels of blood glucose, there must be, as the blood flows through this organ, an organ that detects the problem. Now that organ is called the pancreas. That's where people have problems that are sugar diabetic. They have a problem with their pancreas. So the, this organ detects the problem, then releases a hormone with a name that you know so well, insulin. Now insulin stimulates the liver to take the extra glucose that's in the blood, the excess that we have, the extra glucose that's in the blood, and the liver will take it out of the blood and store it in here. Now stored glucose has a name. It's called glycogen. So do you see the plan the body has made? It detected the problem here in the pancreas. Then insulin was secreted to stimulate the liver to take the extra glucose out and actually put it in here, to store it in the liver in the form of a chemical called glycogen. What is the result if you follow the dotted line here? Because remember, we've been following the dotted line. The result is there's a decrease of glucose in the blood because it has been packed away in the liver. Now the blood glucose levels go back to normal and homeostasis has been achieved. Everything is back to normal. But what is the situation when the opposite happens? When you sometimes, let's say you rush to school in the morning, you have not eaten, you have low blood glucose levels, you get here to break time, you didn't take money to buy something at the tuck shop, and by one o'clock in class, the teacher asks you, why are you lying on your arms? You are tired, you have no energy. Now that is too low concentration of glucose in your blood. What will your body do to correct the matter that at least you have energy to go back home to perhaps walk in and catch a taxi? Let's have a look at that. When there are low levels of blood glucose, that's now the opposite. Let's now follow the solid line. Once again, the pancreas detects the problem. But now, the pancreas releases a messenger, a hormone, which is opposite to insulin. Now, this one is called the following. Glucagon. Glucagon. Now, glucagon is the opposite of insulin. And what it does, it stimulates the liver to inform the liver, now increase the blood glucose levels again so that it can go back to normal. Do you see these two hormones work opposite to one another? Insulin lowers the glucose levels in the blood and glucagon raises it again if it's too low. Let's identify the organ that we saw there, organ one. We know it was the pancreas. We've labeled it already. Now, the next question, remember here, the pancreas was the organ number one. And this organ releases a hormone called insulin. When? When the blood glucose levels are too high to bring it back to normal again. But the opposite happens. If you have too low, then the very same organ, the pancreas, releases the opposite hormone, glucagon. There you see it. To also bring it back to normal again. Let's look at the question. Describe the role of which hormone? Insulin. In the balancing, the homeostatic control of the glucose concentration in the blood specifically. So let's look at how one would describe that. The pancreas is the organ that detects the increased concentration of glucose in the blood. So the pancreas, in the case, if the blood sugar is too high, too high glucose concentration in the blood, it's dangerous. It is even above 120 milligrams per 
100 milliliters of blood. It's even higher. It becomes a dangerous situation. Now the pancreas releases that messenger, insulin. It travels in the blood, and insulin brings a message to which organ to fix the problem? The liver. What must the liver do? It must take it out of the blood, because it's in the blood where it is too high. It must take it out of the blood and store the glucose in the form of what chemical? Glycogen. Do not get mixed up between the opposite of insulin, which is glucagon, and glycogen. Glycogen is stored glucose. When it's packed away in the liver, we call glucose glycogen. Now the concentration of glucose in the blood goes back to normal. And this is a miracle that you and I can be healthy, that we don't suffer from sugar diabetes. So people who have a, a decreased secretion of insulin, they're not producing enough insulin in their pancreas, what do they do? They get a prescription from the doctor, the doctor advises them to go to the pharmacy and now inject them with insulin which has been produced in the lab. Because their pancreas does not produce enough insulin, on a daily basis they must inject themselves with insulin to create this homeostatic control because the body is not doing it. You and I that perhaps don't have sugar diabetes, we have sympathy with our relatives who have it and we look after them well. Some of them take tablets only, but um, for us that are healthy, we appreciate that our pancreas is secreting enough insulin to bring the blood glucose down back to normal. Let's look at some other questions. Now, graphs you will always get as part of this work. The graph below shows the glucose concentration where always the problem is too high in the blood. Uh, we will be looking at two people and they are going to have a meal. The meal is very high in sugar. Let's see what the graphs tell us. Now, when you look at the graph, you'll first of all see here this graph has no title. So we need to give the graph a heading. What can you see here? Let's investigate a bit and see what do we see. Can you spot some trends here? Look on the, the y-axis. On the x-axis it shows time is going by, but on the y-axis it's measuring actually how much glucose there is, the glucose concentration in the blood. Now when you look at a range between 80 and 120, that is normal. But look at this uh, young man here, Tabiso. Is Tabiso not above 120? Tabiso has a problem. He is suffering from diabetes. Diabetes mellitus. Because he's constantly above the normal level. The average is run about here at 100. But I mentioned that between 80 and, and 120 is a range that's seen to be considered to be normal. Now, if you look at Tabiso, from the graph, he's ingesting a meal with high glucose. And so does his friend Mo. But Mo seems to be normal with regards to glucose concentration. So when both of them eat, what happens to the glucose levels? It goes up in the blood. It increases in concentration in the blood. So what happens next? Don't you think there must be a hormone released here to bring it down? In his case, also in the case of Mo, there must be a hormone released here, and this hormone is insulin, to bring it back to normal again. So from this, we've learned a lot. But let's go to the questions. The first question says, provide a suitable title for this graph. Now here's an obvious answer. It's a comparison of the blood glucose level of two people before and after a meal. No problem to provide that graph with a heading. So how long did it take Mo's blood, this is a question that we saw in a previous paper, to return back to normal after consuming? Now I calculated this answer as that, but how did we get to that answer? Let's just go back to the graph, the question was for Mo. Three, two, one. So welcome back. 
let's have a look at what we've done so far, and then we'll go into that interesting topic of sugar diabetes. What goes wrong that some people in our families suffer from diabetes mellitus, which is sugar diabetes? Let's have a look what we've done so far. We've had a look at carbon dioxide and how the body actually controls it. The body has to make sure that the carbon dioxide levels stay normal. On top of that, we should not have too high concentration of water in our blood and in our tissue fluid, also not too little. We also spoke about the salt concentrations. It should not be too high nor too low. But when we come to glucose, we understand that the normal levels of So, welcome back. Let's see what we've done so far, because now we're moving into the last section of the work where we will be discussing sugar diabetes and how does your body prevent uh, you from suffering from diabetes mellitus, which is sugar diabetes. But let's just summarize what we've done so far. Remember we said carbon dioxide concentration should not be too high in the body. The body makes plans to get rid of the carbon dioxide. Water should not have too high concentration in the body, in the blood and the tissue fluid. The same with it should not be too low, it should stay at normal levels. The same with salt. This is the homeostatic control of these aspects, so that the salt should just stay at a regular level. If you have too high salt concentration or too low in both cases, you have medical problems, serious trouble. The same applies to glucose that we will be discussing now. You and I should have exactly, or more or less we can say, 100 milligram of glucose for every 100 milliliters of blood. This is the correct level. If it's higher than this, this is when a person constantly, if it's higher constantly than 100, you say a person suffer from sugar diabetes. So when we talk about sugar diabetes and your blood glucose control, the homeostatic control of the glucose in your blood, there are certain terminologies that we need to understand. And there's a few words where learners always go wrong. And I don't want you to make that mistake. Let's see what these terminologies are. We will learn about two hormones. These two hormones are opposite to one another. The one is insulin and the other one is glucagon. They work opposite to one another. Look out for that. And do not mix up glucagon with this word spelt with a gly. Glycogen is different from glucagon. Do not mix up these two words that you see here. Glucagon and the one was spelled with a Y, glycogen. It's totally different uh, chemical structures. We will look at how does your body maintain a constant glucose level in the blood. Because if it doesn't, it's very dangerous. And in the exams and tests and projects, you always get graphs. So let's look at the first question. Typical exam question that we've seen in past papers, and I would like you to carefully watch because when you just look at it, it seems to be difficult, but it's not. I want you to follow the dotted line with me, please, that you can see here, the dotted line that we see here. Do first, ignore the solid line here from the bottom because we're going to look at a scenario if you have a problem with you've eaten and now the levels of glucose are too high. What will be the situation? There's an organ in your body and in mine that will identify the problem. Now that organ is called the pancreas. It's close here to your stomach area and your abdominal cavity, close to the liver that you see here. And it cooperates with the liver because the pancreas detects the problem, then releases a messenger called insulin that you've heard of so often. Insulin is a messenger bringing a message from the pancreas, it travels in the blood to the liver to stimulate the liver to say, this glucose that's in the blood, 
must be taken out of the blood and stored here in the liver. It must be packed away so that it can come back to normal again in the blood. Now the stored glucose, once the glucose is stored, we call it what? Glycogen. That is stored glucose. But what happens if you have the opposite scenario? If you have too low levels of glucose in your blood, then the pancreas detects once again the problem. It also releases a hormone, but this time another hormone, not insulin. It releases a hormone which is the opposite in its functioning. And this hormone is called glucagon. Glucagon. Now what glucagon does is just the opposite. It stimulates the liver to say that the glycogen you stored convert it back to glucose so that it can go back to normal. Do you see how amazing your body is? If you have too low levels of glucose, you feel tired. Maybe you did not eat in the morning, then glucagon will be secreted by your pancreas to push up the glucose levels in your blood that you can still concentrate at school even though you did not eat. But I do advise you, have a good breakfast, eat something that you can have energy when you are at school. On the other hand, if your glucose is out of control, it's going too high, then it must be brought back to the normal under the influence of insulin. That is the homeostatic control of glucose to keep everything the same in the blood. If it doesn't, if it goes out of control, it's medically very dangerous. It could lead to death. That's why people that suffer from sugar diabetes who are not producing enough insulin from the pancreas buy insulin from the pharmacy. They can inject themselves or take it orally by means of tablets. The insulin then that they take will bring it back to normal again, the glucose levels, just like the normal functioning of your insulin. So let's now move to some other questions that we've seen in past papers. Identify the organ that we saw there at number one. And we saw that organ is the pancreas. Uh, here's the organ clearly, the pancreas. Now, the next question will refer to this hormone and this hormone. Can you remember what these hormones are? Can you spot them? Remember the hormone number two was insulin. Insulin. Why is insulin secreted? To bring the glucose back to decrease the glucose levels in the blood. And the opposite one is glucagon. To increase, so that it every time goes back to normal to increase the glucose levels in the blood. So we've identified the hormones two and three. Now describe the role of insulin in the homeostatic control. What does insulin really do? We have discussed it. The pancreas is the organ that detects the problem. This is the homeostatic way of solving problems. The problem is the glucose concentration in the blood is too high. So now what is released? Insulin is released. The pancreas now secretes insulin. And what does insulin do? It stimulates the liver to store that glucose in the form of glycogen. And the concentration of glucose in the blood goes back to normal. So now we see how insulin works. We've uh, re referred to it and also the way you should answer it when you get a revision question. It's very interesting to understand this, but you must be able to put ink to paper like we've done here as an example so that you can uh, be assessed and get good marks. But what you will always get when it comes to projects and tests and exams with regards to glucose control, the homeostatic control of glucose, are graphs. Let's look at examples of that. The graph below shows the glucose concentration in the blood of two people, and these people are going to eat something. And they're going to eat a lot of sugar, and then we're going to see what's going to happen. Now, here's the graph. Now, the first problem you see with this graph, it has no title. A graph should always have a title or a heading. 
when you look at this graph, what heading can you and I write for it? We see time is going by. We see there's two people here, Tabiso and Mo. We see they've had a meal rich in glucose where the arrows are here. We also look on the y-axis and we see what we have on the y-axis is the amount of glucose per 100 cubic centimeters. Now what's considered to be normal is in a range between 80 and 20. So already you see there's a problem here with Tabiso. Tabiso is suffering from which condition? Why is he suffering from diabetes? Because his glucose levels in the blood are constantly above the normal. It's look where it is here, and then it even goes up. It comes a bit down, but it stays high. While his friend Mo is more or less in the normal range, eats uh, high sugar meal, glucose goes up, and then it comes down back to normal under the influence of insulin. So let's look at a few questions that we can get with regards to this graph, because this was really a question that was asked a few years ago. Provide a suitable title for the graph. Now, what would you say? Don't you think it would be a comparison of these two people? Comparison of what? The blood glucose levels of the two people when? Before and after a meal. A very logical title. You don't have to stress about giving titles. Just explain what you see on the graph if they ask you to give a heading or a title for a certain graph. There's nothing difficult about that. But we want to be able to interpret graphs. Graphs tell a story. Let's see. So how long did it take for this person, Mo, to return to its original level when it started after he consumed the meal. Now, in doing the calculation, I found it was 108 minutes. Now, let's just go for a moment to the graph again and see here what do they mean. They say we need to calculate this was the original level here. So how long did it take to be from this level again to more or less where it was in that level. So if you count from here, it was at one hour, and then it ended, isn't it here more or less at this level when it's back to normal? At 2,8 hours. So what is the difference between 2,8 and 1? Is it not 1,8 hours times 60 minutes? And then the answer is 108 minutes. It took 108 minutes from the moment he ingested the meal. It went up to the point where it went back to normal again. So it's from one hour up to 2.8. The difference is 1.8 and the minutes are 108 minutes. Now the question asked here, explain the changes now in Mo's glucose level in this period X. How, what happened there exactly? Let's have a look in this period that's called period X. What happened to Mo from the moment he went to a peak of glucose concentration until the point it went back to normal and even a bit further here at three hours after the investigation started? What is the role of insulin? So we go through our homeostatic process again. And we ask ourselves, what is the imbalance here? The imbalance is, it is a higher than normal for Mo glucose concentration. So that's the imbalance. Which organ will identify the problem? Did we not say it will be the pancreas? We are solving this problem just like your body will solve the problem. What is the name of the control center? It's still the pancreas. Which hormone is involved in the case of the sugar going higher? Did we not say earlier the hormone is insulin to bring the sugar levels back to normal again because it was too high? And then the organ involved to correct the problem? The organ solving the whole problem under the instruction of the pancreas, was it not 
the liver. Now we see how amazing your body is to correct matters. Now, just to summarize, let's have a look at what we've done. We have seen there's two hormones. The one is the opposite of the other. Insulin causes the blood sugar to go down. Glucagon causes it to go up. What is glycogen? Do not mix up glucagon with glycogen. Glycogen is stored glucose. The homeostatic control of blood glucose we saw is under the influence of these two hormones. And we also saw that you must practice graphs before the time. So in conclusion, what have we done? We've looked at the homeostatic control of carbon dioxide. It should not be too high. We've looked at water balances. The salt should be correct and how to prevent sugar diabetes, we had a look at glucose concentration. So I believe this revision lesson has enhanced your learning that you've had already at school in discussing homeostasis. Now you've, practicing, you've been practicing and you're ready for any assessment. Best wishes to all of you.